Welcome to our Tuesday Nighters. Um, and I pray that the Lord blesses you tonight with uh, the last installment, in fact, of our of our class that um, we've gone through now for this being the fourth week, Acquainted with Grief. This is from the scripture that Isaiah makes a statement concerning Jesus Christ about. And uh, the idea is that it ex has expanded for all of us. And maybe, just maybe, we're finding each one of us are just a bit acquainted with grief. Tonight's class is called, If Not Now, When? And If Not Me, Who? We've all heard this term before. And now we're going to see if we can have it apply to acquainted with grief. So let's do a quick review. For the last three weeks, we've we've struggled to, through uh, this strange and, and what I think is an elusive subject based on my next statement, and the subject is grief. Although grief is an, a universal experience, all of us are touched by at some time or another, some more than others, it remains challenging to locate those who are able to clearly the key there is clearly identify any lingering grief within themselves. And I wondered about that a lot over the last week or three. Is it due to grief being viewed as weakness in some cultures? And that brings on this unwanted vulnerability, so we don't want our, our any association to it. Is it a belief that, that the pain that we felt at some point is either forgotten or healed? Are lesser issues of grieving not related to one's death, but the loss of so many things that can bring on grief? Are these lesser issues seen as unworthy of our recognition or our addressing them? Is it possible that they could be buried and carried within ourselves without us really even noting it? Or do the hurts just remain and we kind of look the other way? If they are still within us and they're now being ignored, then these must be unresolved sorrows. And they might just be the little things that fester and afflict. I, I, my analogy tonight is, have you ever had a splinter that when it first goes in, it, it hurts, but okay. And you think you get it out in a day or three or four or five later, it's become infected. And while this tiny little sliver hurts so little at the beginning, it's now so painful. And so the splinter can't be ignored any longer. It has to be acknowledged. It has to be addressed. It has to be removed. And I believe so it is with our grieving. <laughs> Even when we fully focus on our grief, it may still never entirely go away. Some people honor the mourning of a loved one as a worthy act by, by the show of their pain. And I understand that. Those that I love most probably will be mourned for the rest of my life. Whether grief should be processed through until washed out of one's soul is not the question tonight at all, or hasn't been for the last four weeks. Because the fact is, unresolved grief can develop into deeper, like that splinter, more difficult problems than just normal grieving would actually deliver. Left alone, it can fester. So the theory presented during the last three sessions in, has involved our involuntary choice to disregard. However you want to call these aches, but what we know is they can be destructive, even if they're unidentified. The after effects of the emptiness left that was created by unresolved grief can leave us, listen to this now, please, can leave us bitter, debilitated, with no ability to fully heal. It is not death 
that creates pain. It's our loss that creates our pain. It's important to note that someone can pass away or something can pass away or some event can create a loss. But it may not be painful to me and it may be of great pain to the person beside me. It is not death that creates the pain. It's our personal loss that creates the depth of this pain. So last Tuesday night, or excuse me, not last Wednesday, the morning after our, our third session, Candace and I took a walk, as we do every day. And on our walk, she asked me this, so what exactly is your goal with this class? And I thought and thought and thought about that all this week. And I say tonight to Candace and anyone else who asks that question, you're right. What is the goal? Bear with me just for one second. I hear a little bleed over and I don't want anyone to be embarrassed. I hear it out there. I just can't find it. Hang on. To get to get through, our goal through the class would be to get through all these types of pains and back to being satisfied with what God has done for you. Good, Sister Betty, good. Okay, we'll go back here. So the goal for, yes, as Sister Betty has pointed out, the goal for all of us is to examine within. Search to find in yourself any lingering pain. Are we carrying and then bearing any unresolved grief from any past losses? Not just death, any losses. These aches are easily discarded, easily overlooked, easily denied, easily avoided. Especially if, if you've already assessed your loss as less than maybe other people you know who have quote-unquote real grief. Or if you see your specific hurt as unequal to the loss caused by the death of a loved one. We start to make these value judgments and then we, we take our pain and we lessen it. And then we don't pay attention to it, thinking it's not worthy of attention. And so we might easily be carrying and bearing our pain. The goal is the release for each one of us from pain. And finally, relief from grief, if you will. Unresolved grief disrupts one's spirit and disturbs one peace. I'm going to attempt tonight to close this subject and make a case for unresolved grief. Here are the after effects or can be the after effects, the next two pages of what might feel or sound familiar to you. So listen for yourself, if not for others that you love. Following loss, some people develop a newfound rage or in, they find that their, their temper is increasingly bad, which can result from pushing grief down so that infection is still within. It's, un, it's unnoticed, it's unnamed, but it's creating something within. And so the results can end up as abrupt explosions. Where did that come from? Or just steady irritability. Again, giving no no real reason to it because it's unknown. Some people continue obsessing with grief if they leave it unresolved. They have an inability to move past recent events that caused it. And this isn't just death. This can be so many different things. Job loss, loss of a friendship, loss of a loved one who breaks up with them. All kinds of things can create this. People are, are hurt and feel lost from, from um, 
disrespect from other people. There are so many sources of this pain. So there's an inability to move past those events due to feelings of deep sadness, deep loss. And we become stranded emotionally without any ability to move forward. You might find these are the people who listen over and over and over to old voicemails of someone they lost, or they replay a moment that caused them regret. I found myself doing some of these things, and I, I find some of this behavior very familiar to situations in my past. Or crying spontaneously at something that's sad, even if it's unrelated. Just sadness being mentioned can can trigger a deep emotion that really doesn't fit the, the, the situation. All because we're obsessing over that pain. Hyper alertness, which turns into a fear of loss. Another loss. Oh, there it goes again. Following loss, things can feel a little more fragile than they used to feel. There's these new feelings of feeling very vulnerable. Everything feels unsafe, unsteady. This initiates thoughts or feelings of high sensitivity. Um, and, and, and we start to prepare for the worst. People who lose their jobs abruptly go to the next job and then they're tiptoeing in everything they do because anything can happen. People who lose a loved one begin to worry and obsess over other people having, having a similar outcome. Unresolved grief disrupts the spirit and disturbs the peace. Overreactions and the behavior fits that. Those who avoid the pain, those who avoid the trauma of their loss, it becomes an incomplete grief, meaning it continues forward, which can result in overreactions. It can create a, a dependence on your, your closest friends or just the opposite, a complete pull away from your friends. Because the whole idea there is to avoid any more loss or pain. I'm going to draw them closer so I never lose them, or I'm going to push away so I don't love them as much. And a friend who lost a, a child, and then the next child was born and was um, sickly. And he told me later, he had a hard time connecting with his son. Now, that son survived and is now uh, 15 years old. But in his first six months, my, my buddy told me he had a hard time connecting. He didn't want to connect for fear of loss. And this becomes patterns of uh, poor behavior in those specific relationships. Another result of unresolved grief can be addictive, self-harming behaviors. We internalize our pain caused by this loss, and then this bears out and develops new, new patterns of bad behavior, addictive behavior that can, can manifest through drugs, alcohol, overeating, work, workaholism, just throwing themselves into their work just to numb themselves. Any number of, of newly developed behaviors just to mask the pain. I remember um, seeing a movie a long time ago, and the woman lost her her son. Hers her loss was a, a death of a loved one, and she. I remember this scene where she was just weeping, and she kept saying to the other person, "Can you take my pain away? Can you take my pain away? Anything to mask the ache." And she was searching for love in this in this scene. Any kind of friendship, any kind of relationship, anything to mask the pain. And the sixth offshoot of, of unresolved grief might be apathy, numbness, even leads to like a low-grade depression. When grief is not confronted, we can become numb. And it can, again, morph into, develop into a, a lower level of depression. And what the result is a disinterest in almost everything. Lack of energy, lack of drive, lack of motivation. All of these behaviors from unresolved grief. So this is real. So I believe the answer to Candace's question is also to acknowledge and address. So I'm going to have this 
um, this same paragraph on the next three slides or four slides. So I'm going to read it now, but I'm not going to read it as we go to the next couple slides. We've all heard testimonies, beautiful testimonies of beautiful experiences that some of you have had healing through your very, very specific grief. Okay, each of us process individually. So it's important that, that none of us feel less than or better than anybody else based upon their experiences. But I wanted to share some of these because maybe they'll help you. Similar physical ailments are, are handled differently from different individuals. Uh, two of us both have the same ailment. A bad back, maybe it is. One goes and gets it adjusted, a chiropractor. Another sees someone about surgery. Another just does exercises. All of them, their own solutions. So I don't want anyone judging anyone else. And so it is with grieving. These are personal decisions. And the most important part of this is we all trust one another enough to say, it's up to you and God on how you find your solution. So here's a couple of examples. Sister Betty has testified about losing so many of her loved ones, including her sweet husband, Brother Jim Alessio. But, but she also lost siblings. And I think this is what she was expressing to us when she told this incredible testimony, when she needed God's help the most. Her answer to this very sincere prayer and to, to God created a challenge, a project for her. God had inspired her to outreach to others who were in pain, send cards of encouragement. And she said these, her efforts, and we call them efforts of love, these, these her efforts helped shift her focus onto the suffering of others. And by doing this, she found her pain began to lessen over time. Beautiful, beautiful testimony of the healing power in giving to others. Sister Patty told of a time when she was so deeply moved by the suffering within her family due to a great loss. Her answers came through God's reinforcement of a greater pain made her, made, reminded her of this greater pain that's felt by those lost without God in their lives. And she felt this shift within and began to mourn for those who had yet to give themselves to the Lord, those who had yet to find their salvation. Now, this didn't invalidate her personal loss, but what it did do is it helped her celebrate the victory her brother-in-law had found before his passing in Jesus Christ. Fabulous testimony. Loss is not always a convenient event. My father's death came after he and I had bettered our relationship, but before we found complete peace. My grief was not just the loss of my father. It was complicated by my guilt. And this required my attention. I began to search his past, which provided healing explanation and left me with more understanding of who he was and why he was. More forgiveness then, more empathy, more generosity, more love, more tolerance. And, uh, and as I spoke earlier, and finally, I found my complete peace in that relationship with my father. What it also did is it exposed my heirs in only seeing my father through his heirs. Now I saw the reasons why, and I was able to let go, fully experiencing the process of grief. There's many ways to get from point A to point B, and that's what these last three examples show. They speak to differing paths, arriving at very similar places. All three souls found themselves in pain. All three souls rescued from that pain. All three of those individuals mourning. All three of those individuals saved from their grief. All traveling differently, individually, on their own personal journey. 
So let's explore a few other options to any of you who might still be carrying grief. Judging no one, but just suggesting maybe everyone. And maybe there's a better way to relieve ourselves of this. And I'll even touch on why that's so important. So the first um, acknowledgement is to get closure. And this isn't just an absolutely wonderful strategy for, for finding closure. It's an option that's available for those of you who enjoy writing, journaling. So this is, this is a solution of three letters. Letters, writing letters. Letter one, write everything you wish you had said or wanted to say before whatever event it was. This includes job loss. This includes the loss of a loved one. This includes uh, something you may have lost. Example, write in your letter how much you loved your father if that's where your grief is found. Express some honest emotion, even if it's anger at somebody. Write it down. It may never be received by that first person, but you're doing it to heal through your own grieving. Write it down. Write in your letter memories of a vacation, some good times. Write in your letter the unfairness of, of how you were treated, if that's your, what you're grieving. What you miss about uh, something, someone, so maybe a job, maybe a community. Write it down to whomever you're writing it to. Take your time. It's important that you say everything you never voiced, everything you need to say. Write it down. Remember, this is a letter that will never be received. It's all for you. It's all for your grieving. The second letter to write. Think about that individual. Think about what you know about that individual, whomever it may be. And then think about what you believe they might write back. And it could be very curt. Thanks, got your letter, love you too. Or, sorry you feel this way about your job. Our policy has always been, whatever you think that individual would respond, write that down. Now, the third letter is the most important. You've written to them. You've written what you think they might have written back to you based on their personality. Now, rewrite that second letter as the third letter. This time, write the letter to what you would want them to say. Thank you. I got your letter and I love you too. Just want you to know how proud I am of you. And I want you to know I have my regrets for how I treated you. All of this so that you might heal. Our policy has always been same, same start as they may have done, but they go further now. But I also realize I singled you out. I mistreated you. And I apologize for how I treated you. I've always been intimidated by strong women who assert themselves, whatever, whatever you need to hear, whatever you want to hear back, that's what this third letter does. And it helps you heal through that closure. Another strategy is to move towards what you might be avoiding. It's much less important to determine why someone is not acknowledging grief in their lives. Sometimes, that's a result of not even considering the cause of the pain. Sometimes it's a denial of the existence of the pain. Oh, I'm not grieving that. that that's not what I'm feeling. Sometimes it's done con unconsciously. And it happens through, um, uh, 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 without a thought. But other times, it happens as a mindful decision to avoid. Some people just don't like confrontation. Denial may be the refusal to see the emptiness as pain or to see the pain as even grief. Yeah, I feel bad, but it's not grief. And so again, we leave it where it is, unresolved. Step one, acknowledge the pain within. Step two, address the pain within. Acknowledge and address. Both of these 
take a tremendous amount of courage because you're stepping into what you've been avoiding. I understand avoidance is a coping strategy. I understand that. But ultimately, all it really is doing is prolonging the pain. It's that splinter that has become infected. While emotionally painful, the natural grief process is, is in place in us, God-given to help us heal. Regardless of the reason, if you get stranded along the process, you can best help yourself by completing the process. We are the ones who stop it and, and get ourselves stuck. So we are the ones who can unstuck ourselves, unstick ourselves, if you will. Change patterns of behavior. Third strategy, change the pattern of behavior you've been on. These bad patterns of behavior, they, they entrap us. And then we just start moving robotically forward in our lives, unaware, purposely unaware of the situation. It can be done with disregard, whether moving in a positive or a negative direction, disregard to, to all that's happening. It can result when we move past or avoid these bad feelings. We kind of circumvent them. Grief can be categorized as the bad feelings that most of us like to avoid. And so we put grief on that shelf and then we go around it. Maybe there's a situation, there's a person at work that, that causes problems. You just go around their desk and never go that route. Maybe there's people in your neighborhood that, that just don't create a positive experience for you. So you don't, you don't visit them any longer. Whatever it is, we do this quite naturally. But when it's grief and we categorize it as quote unquote bad feelings and we're avoiding it, we're just prolonging it. These decisions made might even be due to our own anxiety or anxiousness. Pushing against that anxiety driven type of behavior can release you from the entrapment or the entanglement of those behaviors that you've been doing. I want you to hear this. And when you do that, you regain your control. And then you can stop the negative cycle and experience the freedom by proactively identifying and changing, acknowledging and addressing those behaviors. And if you get stranded again along the way, whatever reason that, that is, you have to choose to get yourself back up. And then, again, ultimately finish the process of grieving. Lastly, if none of these, if you're finding none of these are working, but you have identified some deep pain, you're just not sure where it came from, or you are sure where it came from and don't know what to do, seek professional help. Grief can be difficult, extremely complicated, often tied to other issues. So you might consult, consider consulting someone you trust, even a therapist, if that's the best route to go. Before doing so, understand, sometimes these are very, very, very short stints just to gain some strategies on how to. Sometimes we're afraid of, of some people in medical field, like, I don't want to do that, but understand something. It happens in kind of every other venture of our life. But grief, hear this, is about you and your relationships. It can be of great help to have others assist you in your grieving. So whether it's a therapist or not is secondary. It may be a minister. It may be a good friend. It may be a, a, someone you value their opinion of. But seeking the help of others can help get you through. We're not always as aware or even know the fix. Remember this, the best ministers, the best therapists, the best assistants in these situations offer non-judgmental listening skills, which should result in your individualized solution, your approach based on your personal needs and situation, and then give you that plan to heal. The sooner we free ourselves, and this is what's most critical, 
from the lingering pain that's within us, the more useful we can become to do God's work. Whether our ailments are physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, there are others who are called and trained to assist, who can help bring complete relief and ultimately release. Keep in mind, it's kind of this simple. Spirituality is this. Love self. This is where spirituality begins. And look at the arrows on this picture. Everything on self. So when we're grieving, when we're in pain, when we're in a, a situation, even a physical ailment, everything's on self. But, but this is necessary to the process. So we start in this box. And then we learn that the most important is to love God. And the arrows start going out. Our love is extended to God. And Jesus Christ says, that's not enough. Love others. Again, the extension is out. But I can't even extend to God, let alone others, till I get myself ready to do so. So again, even simplifying on that, spirituality is this, needful selfishness. And you've heard me say this over and over and over again. I don't say it as a bad thing. I say it as a beautiful thing. The most selfish steps you'll ever take are the steps into the waters of baptism. And the most selfless steps you'll ever take are the steps out of the waters of baptism. As it is with all of these, the most selfish just, some of the most self, selfish steps you'll ever take is towards yourself to fix the grieving. And the, some of the most selfless is when you can help others in their grieving. Love God, love others as you love yourself, says Jesus Christ. He understands it has to start with me. And I have to get myself healthy before I can help anyone get themselves healthy as well. Lastly, in support of those slides. This was just another exploration into achieving what God intends for us. I love the scripture that says, Adam fell that men might be. In simple form, Adam's fall, man's fall was necessary in order for the creation to happen. Adam fell that all mankind might flourish. And then once that purpose was identified, then he identified the purpose of that creation. And men are coming right behind that in the verse. Adam fell that men might be. Men are that they might have joy. We were created from that fall so that we individually might be joy-filled. Now, I count this as one of my greatest truths I've ever read in the Word of God. But we aren't the only ones who hear this truth. The evil one knows God's intention for us, that we would be filled with joy. So the evil one's intentions are to keep us from achieving God's intentions. So getting us stranded in unhappiness getting us stranded in sorrow, getting us stranded in grief, accomplishes this. So unresolved grief can be identified then as a clever, successful trick that Satan uses to hurt and harm. We must acknowledge and address our unhappiness, our sorrow, our grief, we must find relief from our grief. And then in following the spirituality, the, the, the definition of spirituality, then help others do the same. So this subject is critical. In order to be used of God, we have to free ourselves so that we might be those ambassadors for Jesus Christ. For open discussion, it's the same slide I've used for